All right, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, it's good, good to see so many of you back. I was wondering uh, how many of you would show up, uh, aside from the people who have to. This lecture is on algorithmic filtering. And uh, the first part of the lecture, we're just going to try to define what filtering is and, and what the problem is that we're we're trying to solve here. Um, the basic problem is there's too much information. There's more uh, news produced every day than any one person could read. And not just news, but uh, you know, news in the broadest sense, right? Think web pages going up. Think uh, social media. Um, it's just um, there's way too much. So we're going we're gonna to discuss that problem, and then we're going to look at a real system called News Blaster, which was an early version of Google News, uh, which the paper for that was in your readings. And we're going to take it apart. Uh, and it's, you know, it's 10 years out of date, so by modern standards, it's, it's pretty simple or simplistic, let's say. Uh, but I think it will give you a real flavor of what goes into these systems. So there's a lot of different flavors of journalism. Uh, but there's this basic idea of you know, a reporter researches and writes a story, produces this product that gets distributed in some other way, and then somehow peace and justice and freedom for all. Right? But we don't really, um, we don't, you know, we haven't really gotten into how that's supposed to work exactly. Um, so here's, here's a little bit of a more sophisticated model where the journalist is getting information from somewhere. Uh, very often, it's an official source, right? So they, this journalist is you know, talking to somebody at the White House, and they're typing up their story with the press card on their hat. And then it gets published, and then it goes to the user. And then in order for anything to happen past that point, the user has to do something, right? Like They, they have to change the way they think or the way they act. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, nothing happens. So this is a little more of a sophisticated model. Uh, but of course, actually, it's not one story. It's lots and lots and lots of stories. So here we're writing about the White House, the banking industry, and killer whales. And uh, so we get three different stories, and they go maybe to three different publications. And uh, then the user looks at these stories, and then maybe they think or act differently because of that. Uh, and it, you know, that's affecting the world. Um, but of course, even this is really simplistic and stupid. Um, it's actually kind of more like this. There's lots and lots of stuff going on. There, look, we've got, we've got nuclear weapons. We've got the oil industry. We've got some environmental stuff. We've got something about the European Union. We've got that guy who's not president. Um, and you know, some of it gets covered into stories, and some of it doesn't. In fact. You know, stories don't exist in nature. Uh, you know, something only becomes a story when somebody decides to write a story about it. So it's actually kind of hard to, to ask questions like, well, how many stories don't get covered? Well, um, it's not covered. It's not really a story. I think they mean something else, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, so some fraction of those get turned into stories. And then there's a bunch of information. And uh, you know, any one person only reads part of it. I mean. How many people, even in the, uh, let's say, the, the sort of good old days of print only, uh, actually read a, a newspaper cover to cover and read every story in it? I'm sure editors liked to think that that happened, but um, normally what you know, I used to see is you know, throw out the sports section, throw out the business section, throw out the front page, uh, lifestyles. you know. Or vice versa with sport or business or whatever it was that you cared about. Right? And uh, so there's this filtering step. And um, yeah, but even so, like a, an actual physical newspaper is a very manageable thing. Uh, that manageability has gone right out the window now. So let's talk about that. Um, this is the Associated Press, an organization where I used to be an editor. Um, so the Associated Press moves about 10,000 stories a day worldwide. Um, 
last time I said that, somebody said, yeah, but aren't most of them just write-throughs of previous stories? Yeah, I mean, that's true, actually. Um, but nonetheless, it's a number in the thousands. Uh, they move about 3,000 photographs and 500 videos, and then some radio stuff, some interactive stuff, right? So, so just a wire service. There's just no way you can read that. Uh, but a major international wire, wire service is actually very small compared to the amount of information that's produced each day. Um, so let's talk about some other things. Um, every second an hour a video is uploaded to YouTube. That's actually out of date. Um, somebody made a nice little picture of it. It's closer to two hours now. Right? That's per second. So that means in you know, 12 or 15 seconds, you get a day's worth of video on YouTube. And, uh, and I'm not helping, because this is going to go on YouTube when, when I'm done. Um, let's think about the 20th century TV networks, right? So you, know, you had basically big, three big networks in uh, the US in the 20th century. And you had you know, a couple television stations per country in most of the 20th century. And uh, I don't know, maybe there was 100, 200 TV stations, you know, average during the 20th century. Um, it's nothing compared to YouTube. All of the material that they ever broadcast is uh, less than what's on there now. Um, it's hard to get, but Google used to display, I don't know if any of you remember, Google and Yahoo used to have numbers like, you know, indexing 10 billion web pages. Do you, anyone remember that? They stopped around 2005 or six, which in web years is like, 80 years ago, because web years are like cat years. You have to multiply by seven or something. Um, they don't say that anymore, but there are estimation techniques to work out about how many pages are indexed. And anyways, it's in, it's in the billions. In fact, um, it's something like a trillion unique URLs now. And of course, a URL is not a, a page exactly, because a lot of these are, are deep web stuff. So you have uh, a URL with a, an ID that actually reads from a, a database, and the database might have a million items in it. Um, so it's kind of hard to count, but uh, definitely more web pages than people. Twitter. Twitter is, uh, as of last summer, uh, last I've checked, was 400 million tweets a day. So let's say that one in every million tweets is worth your time. That's still 400 a day. So if you're looking at an eight hour day, that's what, 50 an hour? That's like, if only one in a million tweets is any good, that's still one a minute. Um, and let's, let's look at some comparative numbers here, right? So uh, 130 million books ever. Uh, first of all, that's a huge number. Second, it's tiny compared to the web. By far, the web is the largest source of information that's ever existed. And it's not like 10 times bigger. It's like a million times bigger. And then uh, in places where we're lucky enough to have laws about transparency and disclosure, uh, for example, the laws that say that when companies have, uh, you know, buy more than 5% of a stock or um, you know, have to make a, dis a material disclosure, as they're called, or you know, all of the various things that publicly traded companies do, you file a document. Uh, in the US, you file these with uh, an organization called the Security and Exchange Commission. They have uh, an online site to search them. They have an FTP site where there's a directory where you can get the last 24 hours. Um, there's generally about 10,000 files in that directory. So it's 10,000 a day. Now think about this for a second. Suppose that you're a business reporter and you're supposed to be covering you know, public companies, right? Um, how are you gonna go through 10,000 a day? You need some way to direct your attention to the few that are important. So let's, uh, let's look at some, some pictures. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to get, give you a visceral feel for this, because it's really hard to wrap your head around how big these numbers really are. So um, 
it's estimated as of a couple years, years ago that um, there were about a billion terabytes of stored information in the world. I'm sure it's a lot more now. So that's this big thing, this zettabyte, which um, is a funny word. And um, to get down to a scale that you're familiar with, right? So you can now buy a terabyte drive. A terabyte drive is a, a fairly reasonable size. You can, um, you know, go to to Causeway Bay and buy a buy a terabyte drive. Um, that's well, you have to go back bound but from a factor of a thousand to get to an exabyte, and a thousand again to get a petabyte, which is this little thing, and then a thousand again to get a terabyte. So we're talking, um, you know, to think about the relations. If, if this is a milliliter, this is a liter, right? If this is, um, volumes are a funny thing, because it's actually a thousand times bigger, but it's only 10 times bigger on each size. Maybe I should do a version of this and compare it to like, uh, in, in the US it would be like, how many Empire State Buildings would you have to fill with data, right? Anyway, it's, it's absurd. And then, then let's compare this to journalistic output, right? So the New York Times, which claims to be you know, a comprehensive record of all of this stuff that matters to Americans, and, and to some degree, people in other countries as well, um, their entire archive, since they started in 1860 whatever, um, or 70, I don't remember anymore. Anyway, it's, it's 13 million stories. And if you assume about um, 1,000 words a story, that gives you about five kilobytes because English words are about five letters average. Anyway, it's something like you know six percent of a terabyte. Uh, so journalistic output is tiny, and there's a mismatch by a factor of not just a million but like billions and trillions between what you can read in a day and what's produced in a day. So the one word for this is, one, one way of describing this is, is information overload. Uh, but there's, there's a nice quote from, from Clay Shirky, who you've probably heard of. Um, he's a media theorist. He's done a lot of work in, uh, on, on internet type stuff. Uh, and he said, well, it's not information overload. It's filter failure. Right? It's, it's reframing the problem from there's too much information in the world to our tools to deal with it are not up to the task. They're not adequate. So let's, um, before we get into how uh, the News Blaster system works, which is going to be you know, the part of the course with the algorithms in it, or the part of the class with the algorithms in it, let's talk about how we actually get the information that comes to us every day. So, you know, show of hands if you read stories on the internet in a typical day. Anyone read anything on the internet? Okay. How do you choose what to read? What do you what do you read? So we've got professional like journalism. Um, some social media, Facebook. How do, do you like go to particular news websites? Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize she was famous on the other side of the world. She, yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice job, Maria Popova. Um, okay, who else? Some, someone else. How do you, where do you, where do you get your information? Uh huh. So RSS feeds. Yeah. So what's what's the filter there? What what is uh, the thing that decides whether or not you see? A particular item. Well, I'm asking, how is it that, of all the enormous amount of information that's published every day, some things you see and some things you don't? 
What's the what's the Mm -hmm. So you've chosen to follow particular feeds, but there's also this algorithmic component that recommends things. Yeah, OK. Um, how else? Anyone else? Yeah. How do you make use keywords to decision to go news? For example, if I want to know what's happening in Germany, mm -hmm. So keyword search in Google News. Yeah. So with the sole exception of we, we um, you know, Christy mentioned going to uh, news organization websites, you're all using online filtering systems, right? Social media, Google News, Google Reader, um, all of these systems are systems designed to deliver to you some set of items from the vast amount that's out there. And it's explicitly or implicitly making choices about not only what you're seeing, but what you're not seeing. And this is a very different model from uh, an editor at a news organization deciding what most people are going to see. So it's really, I mean, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's been long enough now that uh, this is obvious. But I think it's worth remembering that uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, this was not the case at all. It's really changed a lot. And journalism hasn't really caught up with this. And one of the ways it hasn't really caught up with this is journalists don't generally talk about designing information filtering systems. So we are. We're going to do that. And we're going to do it right now. News Blaster. Um, why don't I just show you News Blaster? So News Blaster was built by some people at Columbia University uh, actually after 9-11 when they wanted to start tracking all of the things that people were publishing about it. Remember, this is 2001. There's no Google News. Uh, I think RSS hadn't been invented yet. I think that was 2002 or 3. Um, oh, wait. There it is. Yes, go here. And either the link isn't working. Oh no. Maybe we don't get News Blaster today. Well, that's terrible. Uh, I think I have a slide of it. There we go. Um, I mean, it's kind of like Google News, right? It's got these categories down the, the left hand side you know, world, entertainment, sports. Uh, it scrapes news from all of these different sources. And then it uh, tries to summarize it. it. It tries to find all of the stories that are about a particular thing and cluster them together. And then it actually tries to summarize them. Um, it gives you a little excerpt. And it's actually what it's doing is putting together sentences from multiple news articles. So very, very similar in spirit to Google News. This is sort of how this system is put together. The first thing you got to do is actually get the information. So it's this big web scraper that reads all of these um, uh, different news sites. Uh, and then one of the main things it does is it tries to group together all of the stories that are actually about the same thing. And then it groups them into categories, and actually categories and subcategories. So first it finds, oh, these 20 stories are all about um, this ship sinking. Uh, these 20 stories are all about this politician's speech. These stories are all about air pollution, and groups them together. And then it says, oh, these are all business stories. These are all sports stories. These are all entertainment. These are all international. 
Uh, and it actually has multiple levels of, of categorization that it uses. And then the last thing it does is it tries to summarize to actually write some text that tells you what the story is, which might actually be the least successful part of the system. But you can see that um, Google News does all of these things as well. Web scraping. Anyone, ever, anyone ever tried to web scrape? Yeah? How, it, well, how was that experience? Yeah, it's hard to get the text out of the article. So they have a, they have a hand-built list of URLs. And in fact, so does Google News. Um, they have a staff that maintains. You can apply to be included in Google News, and they'll say yes or no. So interestingly, there's still this like human gatekeeping happening. It's not the entire web. It's a certain set of sites. There are systems that scrape the entire web. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so they have a list of front pages, and then they just crawl from each front page and spider from that site, and they get a list of URLs. Then we have to pull out the text of each article. That's actually very hard. Um, so HTML5 is supposed to make this easier. It's got this thing called the article tag. And the article tag, uh, actually, um, it's just the equivalent of div. It carries, it doesn't do anything in terms of how the browser displays it. But the idea is that it's semantic markup. And what it is is, it's the web browser or the, the page author telling whoever's reading the HTML, which could be a program that you wrote, that this is the core article. Um, and there is the definition in, in specification. Uh, the only problem is that uh, almost nobody does this yet. Maybe it will become more prevalent. Uh, but uh, if only life were this simple. Um, there's this other format called HNews, which is sort of a similar semantic thing. Um, this was an, I, think, I think it's fair to say this was an early attempt at uh, the same sort of problem to tell a computer program where the main body of the story was on the page. Uh, it's, you know, I think a few hundred news organizations used it. It was something the AP was involved in. And it's really, it's just solving this problem again. Like, if you think of a page, right, let's, let's, I mean, let's do this. Um, someone tell me a, a news site to go to. New York Times. Oh, everybody says NY Times. Let's do another one. Guardian. Guardian. Oh, Gawker. Let's do Gawker. <laughs> That's way more fun. OK. All right, so um, we'll just pick the first story. Wow, here's someone who's unemployed and suicidal. That's cheery. All right, so here's this page. And so when we're doing text analysis, what we want is like this stuff, basically. Right? But if we do a view source, so we've got, I don't even know what that is. My god, what is that doing? Um, some stuff. Uh, we've got a meta property. Some like, That looks to be like the. Some mobile stuff, because it's got to run mobile. We've got some more JavaScript. Widget startup, so that's probably stuff down the side. Uh, that's a headline. But I think this is metadata. Um, that's inline CSS, which is probably they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, there you go. There's some text. And then now we've got comments. We've got some ads. Yeah, this ad container. Uh, this looks like analytics. Anyways, you can see it just goes on and on and on. And um, it's not immediately obvious where the text of the article is. So scraping sucks. Um, uh, the, you know, in 2000. And Two, when this paper was written, this was a reasonable approach. All they do is they, they find the, they parse the uh, HTML, which you, you really, realistically, you have to do anyway. Um, you can't do it with regular expressions. There's a famous rant about trying to parse HTML with regular expressions. And if you come up to me afterwards, I'll show it to you. It's kind of brilliant. Anyway, um, so you've got to parse the HTML, like reconstruct the tree. 
which there are libraries in Ruby and Python for doing. So that's you know relatively painless. And then they just took the 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 element with the most amount of text in it, which is actually uh, not bad, right? That would probably work on this, because I think this one div Yeah, well, it might fail here, right? Because it, that article is more than one div. Like, it's got block quotes in it. Anyway, that's what they did. Um, there are APIs. There are businesses that specialize in this technology. Uh, if you've, in Safari, there's that little reader button, which goes from the thing on the left to the th thing on the right. And it's an entire service, uh, web service, that uh, all it does is scrape and, and solves this problem for you. Um, Anyway, text extraction hurts. So then they have to cluster events together. So based on all of our discussion in the text analysis and clustering lectures that we had on Saturday, how do you think we can, first of all, let's define the problem. The problem is now we've got this big database of thousands, potentially millions of news articles which are just plain text at this point. And now we want to group them into articles which are about the same thing, uh, ab about the exact same event, if possible. So if we have two stories that are written about a train crash, they get grouped together. How do we do it? Where do we start? Yeah, the corpus is the. Corpus would be that, that set of documents, and then you could process individual ones together to find out how to group them. Yeah, I mean, I think they were talking about starting with the course categories for the later part, which is like breaking them into topics. This is just, are these two articles about the same thing? And they might come from different news sites. So, how do we find, group together all the articles that are about the same thing? We, we did a lot of this last time. Anyone? Well, it's the highest ranked word in the similar mm -hmm. OK, so can you develop that a little more in terms of the process of, of figuring that out? So there's a couple ideas in there. So the first is we, the basic thing we have to do is compare if two documents are similar. So how do we do that? I know you know the answer to this. We spent several hours on it. So how do we compare if two documents are similar? We start with tokenization, and then? How, how do we represent a doc? Cosine distance. cosine distance, yes. Our friend cosine distance. Yeah, that's what we do. We use that whole document vector model. Uh, we, we turn each document into a feature vector. We weight the words by TFIDF, and we take cosine distance, and then we cluster. Ta-da. Uh, it's exactly what we studied on Saturday. Um, the part that we didn't study is uh, a clustering algorithm. Uh, we studied, we mentioned them very briefly, and I, in fact, used one. Do you remember when um, 
I did the, the voting example and I printed out the clusters and it was just this long list of numbers. That's what we want here. We want the computer to group the stories into uh, similar events where each, each cluster is one event. But we didn't really talk about how to do that because what we did instead was the visualization with multidimensional scaling. Um, that is not a clustering algorithm. Multidimensional scaling is, is a projection algorithm. It puts dots on the screen, but we don't want dots on the screen. We actually want in the computer a list of all of the links that are talking about the same news event. So we actually have to take a little detour here to talk about uh, clustering algorithms, which are this fundamental thing in, in computer science uh, and all of the sort of data analysis work that we're going to do. Uh, and it's you know, stuff that you should have under your belt if you're going to try to do text analysis uh, work. Because remember, when we did this visualization of all of the, all of the House of Lords stuff um, and then the stuff that I was doing in um, in overview. Well, let me, let me make this concrete, uh, which I will need a command prompt to do. All right, so here's the same thing that we did, uh, we were looking at last time, the same set of documents, all of these press releases. OK, so I did this, which is the part that everybody loves and is woo -hoo, very, very nice. Um, such, a, such a fun demo. So this, this is the, the, the visualization. This is the multidimensional scaling. And I, as a human, can say, oh, this looks like a group of stories. But the computer doesn't, hasn't actually grouped those together. All it's done is computed where to put each dot. What we want instead is this where if I grab this group of stories, there's this one node here. There's the, the, the top node, uh, down one. There you go. See that? That's exactly the same dots. It's these 27 documents, this folder here. And the computer has worked out that these 27 documents are about, well, they're, they're similar as measured by cosine distance. Um, and so I guess they're about fire department stuff because you can see the the, t the top words here. We learned how to do this, this visualization. We talked about that. We didn't really talk about how you build this, this tree of topics and subtopics. So this is a broader topic, and then each branch in that is a, is a, a smaller topic within that topic. It's clusters and subclusters. So we're going to talk about that now. Again, the difference is the output of the visualization algorithm is a picture, and it's the human who builds the groups, who says, oh, this looks like a group of things. The output of a clustering algorithm is a list of items in each cluster. So they, they kind of have different uses. Um, there's, there's different types. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can go. You can, there's this, this sort of k-means type, which I give you that little, little demonstration where it found all of the points nearest each center and then moved to the center to all of the points that were assigned to it. There's other algorithms that, you know, it starts by randomly assigning stories to different events and then it tries to swap them, right? It says, if I switched these two, would I have better clusters? Um, and then they're the hierarchical and, and there's, basically you can work bottom up by starting with the individual stories and then grouping them together. Or you can work top down by starting with everything and then breaking it apart. So this is, um, this is what agglomerative, agglomerative hierarchical clustering looks like. It's a, it's a dead simple algorithm, really. Um, and does everybody know what I mean by a leaf node? We'll get to, OK, we end up with a, what you end up with a clustering algorithm is uh, a hierarchical clustering algorithm is, is a tree. So a, a flat clustering algorithm just gives you a list of these are your clusters and these are the items in each one. A hierarchical clustering algorithm gives you this tree. It says 
you know, here's this node, and inside it I have these smaller nodes, and then inside that one I have these smaller nodes. So what we do is we start with the smallest unit. So we start with this document. And we say, initially, each, every document is its own cluster at the bottom. Those are the leaves of the tree. And we say, let's pick the two closest ones and put them in the same cluster. So I don't know if we, I mean, we guess we've got to zoom in a little bit to do this. Oops. Maybe the two closest ones are this one. Come on. Oh, select this one and that one, right? We say, OK, well, let's put those together in a cluster. There, now we've made a cluster. Then we repeat it again, and we say, this one and this one, and this one and this one. And eventually what happens is the two closest clusters will be like this one and this one, and then we'll group those together and say, OK, now that's a cluster. So far, so good. Hmm, I'm getting the feeling that I'm getting blank stares here. Anyone want to uh, tell me that this isn't making sense? I can try to explain it another way. You stop when you have only when every everyone is one cluster, and when, if you keep merging clusters, eventually you only have one left. And that's the root, right? So that, that's here. That's this thing at the top. So what, what agglomerative clustering does is it starts at the bottom, right? It you know, merges this one with this one. And then eventually, so what you can see here is like this, this one here where you have um, you know, this, this parent that has three children, left, middle, right. Eventually, those got merged into that one that's above it. And if you, if you actually look at the, the spatial structure of this, you can see what it's doing, right? So here is the left side of this. Here's the right side of this. And then they got merged into that one, which is both. I think, I think the red light is an obliterating of this because it's just merging sequentially. Um, like yeah, you're, you're keeping track of the sequences of merge, merges. And then that gives you a categorization system from the top down. Does that make more sense? OK. Um, so in the case of news stories, you take the two stories which have the most similar feature vectors, so those lists of words that we saw in the assignment, and you compare them with cosine distance. And there's two that are going to have like all of the same top words. And you start with those, and you say, ah, these are the same story. And you keep grouping. And then you can do it from the top down as well, right? You start with everything in one big cluster. and uh, then you split it. You try to find some way to split it so that the pieces have some separation between them. Right? So if I start with everything, where's everything? There we go. Right? And then what I want to do is I want to break it in some way so that there's pieces are far apart from each other. Well, maybe the first thing I can do is say, well, let's break these apart. So I sort of draw this line from here to here. And you're looking for the line that makes the pieces far apart. So for example, if I have this set of items, and this is what we're looking at as a, a two-dimensional representation of, a, of a, a space of documents that are actually in very high dimensions, right? But it's, it's, I'm sort of doing it by analogy. And what I'm looking for is a way to break them in two um, so that the parts on either side kind of look like clusters, right? And so if I sort of take this line, I'm like, well, I don't know. They, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't look quite right, right? This, I don't know why those would be on one side and those would be on the other. But if I take something like this line, you're like, oh, OK, I see. There's kind of like. There's some, a little bit of space between them. And so you're looking to try to make them as far apart as possible at each step. Um, and this is the idea. You get this tree. right? In this case, P, Q, R, S, T are the items that you're trying to group. And 
all you're doing with the different direction, with the agglomerative versus divisive is you're going in opposite directions. So you either start with everything and you try to break it down into pieces or you start with the individual pieces and you try to group them. And you record the, the sequence of decisions. And, um, oh, there's, there's one more thing. We, we, here it says find two closest clusters. What, what does it mean for two clusters to be close? Because we have cosine distance, but cosine distance doesn't measure the distance between groups of documents. It measures the, dis the distance between individual documents. So if I, if I say, how far apart are these two documents, uh, you can say, well, I can use cosine distance and compute that. If I say, how far apart are these two clusters, what does that mean? Yeah, so that's one definition. You can take the closest two points, right? So you can take that distance. Um, you no, could. I, I meant in each cluster, uh -huh. choose the one that's the closest to everything else. So like the centroid. One. Oh yeah, the, the centroid. Yeah, so that's another that's another possibility. You can find one that is the sort of center of the cluster. All right. So maybe maybe it's this one and that one, and look at that distance. That's comparing cluster centroids. That'll work too. Um, or you can take the average distance between all pairs. And there's a number of standard definitions. So that's single link or minimum distance. That's the closest of any two pairs in the clusters. There's the maximum distance, which is the farthest of any two pairs. And then there's the average distance. And you can see there's various formulas for computing them. And it's not a question of whether they're right or wrong, but they're going to do different things. So for clustering news stories, um, maybe we want to use the maximum distance, because we might say, well, you know, if two stories are really, if t we've, say we're starting from the bottom up, right? We're grouping stories together, and then we've got these two chunks, R and S, and we're saying, are these about the same story? Because that's really the question we're asking. And we can say, well, the maximum distance between any story in R and any story in S, in other words, the, the furthest similarity, uh, we want to make sure that every two stories in the resulting cluster are at least this similar, so, you know, at least similar to some threshold. Because say we've worked out that you know, cosine similarity of 0.7 is a really good indicator of whether two stories are about the same event. So we're going to say, OK, everything has to be at least as close as 0.7. So that might be the way. And there's really no, there's no formulaic answer to this. You just sort of have to try it. Um, uh, Overview actually uses uh, the single link distance, the minimum distance, uh, not for any deep philosophical reason, just because there's a, we found a very efficient algorithm to do it. Um, you can see that these algorithms might not have the same efficiency because the uh, in particular, the average distance is a sum over all pairs. And that is going to be quadratic in the number of items. Does that make sense to those of you with a CS background? What's that? Well, there, there's going to be some. Uh, what I mean, basically, is that if you, any time you have to take all possible pairs, you're going to have something proportional. If you have n items, you have something uh, proportional to n squared. So that means that if you double the number of documents, it's going to take four times as long. And if you 10 times the number of documents, it's going to take 100 times as long. So you really, it, it gets expensive fast. Whereas the other ones, to find the minimum distance or the maximum distance, there are, there are hashing techniques. There's all kinds of tricks you can do to do that uh, in linear time, which means you get to scan over Basically, you scan over the complete list of items, but you only do it once. Or you do it a constant number of times, like maybe you scan it twice or something. But you don't scan it. You don't scan a list of n items n times, which is what you have to do to compute the average distance. And what you get is uh, you get a tree. And th th this is a visualization of a tree called a dendrogram. This, uh, um, packages like R will draw this for you. 
Uh, and what, what you're actually looking at is, this is a record of the series of decisions you made about splitting. So actually what this is, is each vertical line is a cluster. And then each horizontal line is a point where that cluster splits. So if you started, if you're doing a divisive algorithm, it's actually, it's missing the root, so there'd be a vertical line here. And then that splits into two big chunks, and then each of those splits into two as well, um, and so on and so on. And eventually you, you stop at the individual items, which looks like they're just numbered. I'm not sure what these numbers mean. Um, and then what you can also do is you can, you can start at the top and you can say, uh, you know, break this down until the clusters, give me all the clusters that are at least a certain distance apart from each other, which is what this thing on the side is, this threshold. And if you set that to, you know, somewhere around here, I guess, uh, then what you'll get is um, these four, I, yeah, no, here, like if it's a 0.6, you get these four different groups. And it, so it's everything in here and everything in here and everything in here. So once you have this tree, you've sort of got this way of saying, well, I have a, I have a method of setting a threshold uh, that ensures that all of the elements in the cluster are at least as similar to each other as some number. And if you're lucky, somewhere in that threshold range is going to be a, th a number that splits all of the stories about all of the articles about the same event into one cluster. So in practice, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to adjust this threshold until, it's, until you find the, the same number, or until you find that it splits your stories the way you want. There's one more complication in all of this, which is that all of these clustering algorithms that we've been talking about, you have to start with the entire set of objects. You have to have all of the stories to begin with. Uh, but um, the thing about news is there's always more of it happening all the time, right? If you're scraping these hundreds of sites, uh, you know, if you're Google News, you probably have hundreds of news stories every second for the thousands of sites that it looks at. So you have to do things a little bit differently. Um, you don't have time to go back and recluster everything. And you don't have the stories before they're published. So that means you have a greedy algorithm, which means you have to make a choice that is the best choice that you can at the time and uh, then move on. And so this is how they do that. This is a single pass clustering algorithm. And you start and you have no stories. And then you get the first story and you say, well, OK, well, that's in its, its that's in its own cluster. And all you do is when a story comes in, um, you see if there's a cluster that uh, it's close enough to. And if it is, you put it in a cluster. And if not, you make a new cluster. So to, to draw this, you start with one story. And then another story comes in. And you have some threshold distance t. So say t is like this far. And they're farther than that, so you say, OK, it's on, it's on cluster. And then another, then another story comes in. So you say, OK, well, that belongs in that cluster. And then another story comes in. And you say, OK, that's its own cluster. And then eventually, you end up with these clusters. Um, Oh, so that actually belongs in that cluster, for example. Like that. And event you have to decide that you're not going to have anything that's more than a certain number of hours or days old, because otherwise it just ends infinitely. So that's all they do. And every once in a while, they, when things get too old, they just remove them. So when we're designing our clustering algorithms, right? So I've talked about clustering algorithms. Uh, there's uh, a massive amount of choice involved. You have a choice of a distance metric on the documents, although cosine distance is the standard. There's many variations. You have a choice of a clustering algorithm. Am I going to do this you know, uh, from the top down or the bottom up? You have a choice of the metric to measure between clusters to decide when you're going to split or merge them. 
Uh, if you're doing this, this uh, single pass thing, you have the choice of this distance threshold. You have, uh, you have the choice of how to represent the documents uh, as feature vectors. You have all of this, this sort of possibilities. And what you want to know is, uh, you know how, do you, how do you know that you have the best algorithm? And what we'd really like is a way to try an algorithm and say, Mm. This algorithm A is better than algorithm B. And that implies a metric. We've got to be able to assign some score to a clustering algorithm. So remember, our goal here is to take a bunch of articles, news stories, and group together all of the articles that are in the same story, right? So these four articles that are in this cluster, they should all be about uh, whatever it's about. So actually, no, let's do this. Let's, use, let's do a real system that's actually doing it. There you go. There are all of these stories on Obama's inauguration, because it just happened and you know he's a president. Um, and somewhere, it's, it, this is harder to get than it used to be. Somewhere it'll actually say how many are in this cluster. They're, they're hiding this more and more. Wow, it's hmm, interesting. They used to say, you know, this many s stories. Oh, the Asian branch. Yeah. Uh, that one's real fun, but if you go down and down. Oh, okay. It used to say like 700 stories. I think it still does somewhere. Oh my god. Uh, no, but that, we don't want web search. I want news search. Hmm, interesting. It doesn't say anymore. Click to see related articles. Anyway, uh, they're not showing it anymore, but they used to, and it used to be like top right. Oh, it says twice, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is that all of these stories, right, all of these stories that it's listing here and all of these little videos and things, they're all the same story. So the point of doing this is to, f is to collect all these links, right? Because it doesn't, it collects them from across the web, all these different sites, and it wants to put them together in some way. I think there's still a way, a way to do this I remember somebody from Google actually showing me how to do it, but they're making it harder and harder to find. I guess they're, they're finding it's not as interesting to show you. Oh, here you go. Here's one. All 611 news articles. There you go. So Georgetown beating Notre Dame, there's 600 odd news articles. There you go. So that's the idea. That's, that's what's in a cluster. Oh, there you go. 20,000 articles on the inauguration. My god. You know, one of the things that um, Google News is amazing for is it shows you how much duplication there is in the journalism world. There's 20,000 stories on the president's inauguration. That's, that's absurd to me. Even if you take a much smaller story, here you go, this, this CNN thing. Oh, no, now I can't get it again. Anyway, it'll still be a couple hundred. Um, P 
people who complain about, you know, s journalists are getting laid off and there's not enough time to cover things and, you know, there's a lot of important stuff that never gets covered. I don't think the problem is that we don't have enough journalists. The problem is that they're all working on the same things. Uh, anyway. Uh, so we have some algorithm. We're trying to group these events. We want to know if we've been successful in doing it. So how do we determine if our clustering algorithm is working and grouping all of these stories together? What's some, some thoughts here? No? Something to try? Well, we have a gold standard. Uh, if I give one of you a thousand stories and I say, here's a weekend and a hundred bucks, please enter them into a spreadsheet and tell me which story, each, which event each article is about. Maybe I'd have to pay you more than a hundred dollars to do it. That sounds really boring. Uh, but people have done this. We have training data sets of news stories that are grouped by events. Or you can, you know, pay your interns to do it. Um, the point is that it's not, or not pay your interns to do it. Yeah, more likely. The, the point is that, that we have training data sets. So uh, it's actually possible to compare what the computer has done to what a human has done. Uh, so, you do this. Um, we talked about different clustering, uh, those different distance metrics. The, um, the minimum distance is also called single link. The maximum distance is also called um, complete, and then the average. And, and then we've got this, this uh, online algorithm as well. Uh, so here's how they perform. So you, you get this error measurement, and the error measurement is basically you know, it's, it's this formula, but it's derived from how many stories the computer classified wrong, right? So the computer said that, you know, this story was the same as this, as these two, but this was actually about a helicopter crash and this was actually about a plane crash. And the computer grouped them together because they both had the word crash in them. And so you can take this error. And then you've got this T parameter, which is the threshold for when, uh, when two things be, get grouped in the same cluster. And uh, so you can see it, right? This single link that, you know, the, it, it, eh, it's not the greatest. It eventually approaches the performance of the others if you get the T just right. And then the other ones, you know, they work better at a lower threshold. And, and this, this group-wise average, the one where you compare everything to everything else, it actually seems to do the best overall. Uh, it's generally lower than all the others, but it's also the most expensive. And then you lose a lot by trying to do it all in one pass, like or as, as the stories arrive one at a time, which is this, uh, this brown one, the X's here. It's generally higher than the others, but actually near the optimum, it's pretty close to the best. So then uh, there's also the issue of how do you encode your document as a feature vector? And uh, what they do is they have all of the words in the document, just like we were doing last time, but they also include entities, so they actually get all of the names uh, of people and places out of the document, and they become uh, features as well. They become binary features, right? So if a story mentions um, Pakistan, you get a one in the Pakistan feature. If it mentions uh, you know, Hu Jintao, you get a one in the Hu Jintao feature, right? Um, and so you can try adding these things into the distance, into the uh, document vector and the distance metric or not, and you get different things. Uh, we're going to talk about entity extraction a few classes from now. In fact, you're going to try it. You're going to use Open Calais and actually um, see how accurate it is. Uh, basically, it's the idea that you pull out the, the people, places, organizations, dates, uh, possibly a couple other things. You know, entities is the generic term for it. 
And it turns out that, um, in general, if you just have, so what, they, what they've done is um, comparing using every word in the document to just the names of the entities in it. And what this is, nominator all is an algorithm to extract entities. Link it is another algorithm to extract entities. And words is just document vectors of the type that we just did on the assignment, right? So, and, and all words is the lowest. So it actually, it really helps to have the computer try to compare the complete language and not just the people, places, or things. And it kind of makes sense, right? If I tell you that this story has, uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama and John Boehner in it, and those are the entities, and Washington, D.C., it could be a story about them attending the inauguration, or it could be a story about them fighting over deficit reduction. You don't know. So adding those extra words helps. But that doesn't mean that it's going to beat some combination. Um, maybe if we weight the names and the words differently, there might be some way to put them together. Anyone got thoughts on how we can combine these multiple distance metrics in, in some way? So we've got three different functions, and they all compute distance in a different way, and we think there might be a combination. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. That's what I just said. Uh, what we can do is we can take a weighted sum. So we're going to say three times the distance on TFIDF plus five times the distance on nouns extracted by Linkit plus one times the distance on uh, nouns extracted by nominate. And we're going to say maybe some combination of that gives us better performance. And this is really, really common, actually. We're going to see this pattern in all kinds of applications that we do, where we've got a bunch of algorithms. And you know, they're each, they each have different strengths and weaknesses, and we have to combine them in some way. And often doing some sort of weighted average on them is the way to go. But then you have to figure out what the right weights are. Uh, and to do that, um, uh, we know what the ideal result is because we know from having humans do the training what uh, cluster, what yeah, what cluster each story is supposed to be in, and we're trying to match it. And so that's uh, that's a standard problem in statistics is. Uh, you know, how do I have, I have some line. Oh, my eraser is on the floor. Oh, actually, it's the other way around, right? I know, I know that I have some, some data, and I know what the correct data is. Um, And now I want some formula that matches it as best as possible, which is to find this line through it. So in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a little different. Um, it's more like, uh, Actually, I'm drawing this the wrong way. Let me think about this. Um, oh, yeah. We want to try to find, we, as we change that weight, you know, how the weight we put on uh, feature vectors versus extracted nouns, at some point, say this is it gets assigned to cluster 0, this is it get assigned to cluster 1. At some point, as we change the weight, it'll jump from one cluster to the next. And we want to try to find the combination of weights that puts everything in the right cluster. Um, so we find this. How does this work? It's been a while since I read this slide. This, this turns into a, a, a logistic regression problem in the end. 
Yeah. So this, this R thing is the thing that I've just talked about, right? So it's this function that if I and J are really about the same story, it's, it's 0, otherwise it's 1. And we want the thing that uh, a, a function, we want to make the distance match that as closely as possible. Because if we had a perfect distance function, then if two stories were really about the same event, then it would say, oh, the distance is 0. And if they weren't about the same event, it would say the distance is 1. So that's what we're trying to match. So that little epsilon, that's the error we're trying to minimize. And um, you can do this with uh, standard statistical regression, right? So it, it's um, you're trying to find the three values of the weights that give you the lowest possible error. And you can, you can actually just type this into a, a stats package, and it'll just do it for you. And um, so really what it comes down to is these are, these are the coefficients for various combinations. They try all possible combinations. And then this is what it, it looks like. This is the, if we just use the words. Um, if this is if we use the words and you know, various other things together. And the minimum, which is the best we can possibly do in terms of matching what the human has done, is about the same for all of them. Uh, but there might still be an advantage to using other features. So looking at this graph, even though the words are, are using just the words uh, is going to get the, the lowest minimum, why might we want to try to use the words plus the extracted entities? So what's this, this uh, what's the x-axis here, this t thing? Yeah, that, that controls how close two stories have to be before the algorithm says, ah, they're actually about the same thing. Well, if that's too, if it's too high, right, and if it's too low, then you end up with uh, too many story, too many articles that are actually not about the same thing, and you don't know in advance how you need to set it. Yeah, it's it's le it makes it less sensitive, right? You've got this unknown parameter. Because, I mean, you know, we, we've defined this distance function, right? We say cosine distance. It returns a number between 0 and 1. If the documents are identical, it's 0. If the documents have no words in common, it's 1. So what does a distance function or a distance of 0.4 mean? Well, I don't know. What's the difference between a distance of 0.4 and 0.5? It's not really, it doesn't really have a human interpretation. And it will also depend on the documents. Um, so we don't really know what to set that threshold as. You just sort of have to change it like a slider and see what it gives you the best performance. But what this is saying, because when you add the entities and things, this threshold is relatively flat, it means that if you get it wrong, you're still much more likely to get a good result. Whereas if you just use the words, when it starts getting too high, uh, you, get, you get bad results. But you know, with this, if we use uh, these other algorithms, we can just basically we can just set it at 0.5, and um, you know, for different document sets, these curves are going to have slightly different shapes and values and things because this is a particular set of training data. But probably, we'll be somewhere. You know, we'll kind of be okay. We won't be more than a few percent off the optimal. So you see this a lot in terms of designing systems for dealing with large amounts of information. Um, you know, anytime you start doing like machine learning or um, you know, trying to, you know, text analysis or clustering, you end up with these sort of arbitrary choices. And it's hard to make the arbitrary choices go away. It's hard to find algorithms that don't have that. But what you can do sometimes is find ways of designing this, the system so that those parameters, so they're not very sensitive to those parameters. So that, that can be a win as well, not just 
it produces better clusters, but it produces better clusters without me screwing with the parameter. Because if it's too sensitive to the parameter, then next week when you have a different set of data, it's going to fall apart suddenly. Whereas if it's less sensitive, maybe it's a little bit worse, but it's probably OK. Whew, OK, so um, that seems like, seems like a lot uh, so far. I get, the, I get the sense that, that uh, people are slightly overwhelmed. Um, some of you have never seen this type of mathematics before, yeah? I'm, I'm guessing. Um, trying to understand how to, how to proceed for, for some of you here. Um, Hmm. I think maybe what I needed was a, a, a demonstration of what it looks like when it works and doesn't work. But basically what you can imagine is if you get this wrong, then under the headline where it says Obama's second inauguration, you have this story, Bunzer's bank should not be so hard on Japan appears in here because the computer found that they were similar. But that, that's a little bit unrealistic because they, they're actually really different. But maybe if I take, there you go, votes in the election. So let's, let's just try election. There's, there's got to be a dozen elections happening in the world at any one point. Oh, here you go, Jordan election and, and Israel election. They're both having elections, right? So maybe if that threshold is too um, high, which means that clusters, stories that are relatively far apart still get assigned to the same group, then what happens is you get a story about the Jordan, an article about the Jordan election in the Israel votes group. So that's really what you're trying to avoid. And it's this, this fussy thing, because on the other hand, if you make that threshold too low, then what happens is these two stories that are both about the election in Israel you're going to have them as two big categories here, right? This is going to say Israel votes in election, and then you're going to have another one that says for Israeli voters, missile file, money, main issues in election. And you're going to, be, you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. Those were both about these stories about the Israeli election. They were talking about the exact same thing. Why did they appear as two different groups? But it's kind of amazing how well uh, the Google News clustering works. I've gone through a couple of them by hand. Um, because I have way too much time on my hands. No, because I was doing a piece of research. And um, the accuracy is like 98%. It, it almost never makes a mistake. There was one that was like 700 stories, and it, it, it got like you know, five of them wrong or something. It's, it's really quite amazing how well this can work if you do it right. I do know the algorithm they're using. Uh, it's in your readings for next week. Um, well, I mean, it, you know, as of 2009 when they published the paper, I mean, I don't, I don't know the details now. Uh, but I have a fairly good idea of what they're doing. And it's a little bit more sophisticated than, than what we just talked about. But it's not really a fundamentally different idea. It's still based on a distance metric and a clustering algorithm. Um, I mean, that's kind of, you know, at, at this point, uh, that's kind of how you do it. And there's lots of details, but that's pretty much it. Um, and in fact, your next assignment will be to design a filtering algorithm. And um, you'll probably end up using a distance metric and a clustering algorithm, because there you go. There's, there's a hint for the assignment. OK, we're going to um, finish up the News Blaster stuff, and then we'll take a break. We're almost done. And then we're going to go on to some stuff uh, which is probably slightly easier. Um, so now we've got stories grouped into individual events. Now we want to group the events into categories. So we want to say, well, it's, it's this. Um, you know, this is an individual story. This, you know, elections, business, entertainment, sci-tech, health, those are larger categories. So how do we do that? Maybe someone who's read the paper will know. So
So if two documents are very similar, or if, if two documents are, are about the same event, they're going to be very similar. The question that I'm going to pose to you now is, So we have these two stories, and you know this is a particular election. And then I'm going to say this story is about, uh, I don't know, let's say a, a big company is going bankrupt. If I have a story now that is about an earnings report for a different company, where do you think it's going to fall in this space? Yeah, it's going to be, you know, it might, it might not be here, because then it would be about the same event, but it's going to be more to this side, because it's going to have a lot of the similar terms, right? It's going to have words like, um, I don't know, business in it, probably, um, earnings, money, economy, report, CEO, all of the things, all of the words you use when you're talking about a business. It'll actually be the other side, won't it? Because it has nothing to do with the business. It might be, yeah. Well, I mean, it sort of depends what's over there, but um, it could be. So what you're, it actually, uh, one way to think about this is you're looking for, remember we had this hierarchical thing? You're looking for the higher level categories, right? So this might be, the election, um, all, and all of the stories about an election, and then all of this stuff might be politics, and then all of this stuff might be business. Right, so politics and election are sort of closer together, or you know, other political stories. And then you know, this purpley thing might be uh, economics, and this, this light blue thing might be um, you know, finance, right? So this could be like manufacturing, and this could be banking. Um, and it's, it's just sort of a different level up in the clustering. You're going to have this, this hierarchical structure. And in fact, you can see that. So here, uh, where, where's a nice example of this? Here you go. When you look at the words that are in here, you're like fees, credit card, airlines, consumers, surcharges. Like, what is this stuff? But what's actually happening is in this document set, all of this stuff to the left is about credit card company fees, which uh, if it ever actually loads the page, you'll see it. There you go. Credit card reform, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then all of this stuff on the right is about airline fees. So in fact, for this document set, what it, what it looks like is, in fact, you can actually see it. Right? There's the whole fees category. There's the left side, which is credit card fees. There's the, other, the right side, which is airline fees. And you can see it's actually like the top and the bottom of this, this group on the right. So there you go. Everything, credit card fees, airline fees. It's also got this one outlier over here, which is kind of interesting that it got grouped. Um, so the actual structure of the document set will depend on what documents you have. But what you can do is you can, and this is I think what you were referencing earlier, you can take a bunch of stories, right? So you start by looking at, at uh, you know, a news site and you say, let's take all of the stories that are in the Europe category and let's compute document vectors for each story, and then take the average of those document vectors. And what you get is you get some sort of signpost. So let's say we did this for the business section. That's the average of all the business stories. That's the average of all the politics stories. So rather than trying to break the data into, into groups, which is what, uh, what Overview has done here with this clustering algorithm, right? It's, it's looked at the structure of the data and said, okay, these are groups and then these are subgroups. And you get kind of weird group, like 
you know, fees is a, a topic in the, co in the context of this set of documents, but you're, you're not really interested in fees as a section, right? Like you don't really have a fees category in, in, on a news site. But what you can do is if you took all of, the, all of the finance stories and averaged them together, you know, you'd get some vector. And then you take all of the stories that, so remember, each of these is a story, and then we, or a, a particular event, each, and then we group them, we group the articles together into events, and then we want to see which category each event is. So then we, we take the distance from the event to the category centers, and we pick whichever is closest, and we say, ah, well, this group of articles is closest to where we know the average of the business articles are, so we're going to say it's a business story. And so that's how it assigns them. And so, and so again, this is what Google News is doing. Um, when to generate this stuff off, off to the side, to make these categories. So it's interesting because some of the clustering comes from the data. Right? We group things based on the data we have. But then for these fixed categories down the side, we've got a, a thing that we stored earlier, and we compare it to a fixed reference. OK, there's one more thing that News Blaster does. Yeah, so there it is, right? Each category has some fixed vector that we've worked out in advance by averaging a lot of stories about that topic. And then the, the story that just came in, we can assign it to a category by just looking which of those angles is smaller. Because cosine distance is measuring those angles. The final thing we do is we take all of the stories, uh, all, of, all of the articles about a particular story, and we try to summarize them. And we're actually not going to talk about how to do that. that um, that, I find that really interesting. That's, the algorithms for doing that don't work nearly as well as the algorithms for doing all the other parts of this. But there, are, there is a whole active area of research for, I'm going to feed you a bunch of documents, and you, the computer, is going to write me natural language sentences describing what's important about those documents. Uh, as opposed to the stuff we've done, which is just lists of keywords, it's actually going to do the next step on the assignment, which is summarize it. Doesn't work very well yet, but um, you know, give it five or ten years, it will. You should know that it will be possible, and uh, I'm sure state-of-the-art systems, I'm sure intelligence agencies are already using this, right? Like the you know the NSA has one of these. So if we call it the news blast, do you see if it really results? Yeah, sometimes. Let's see if it's running. It didn't seem to be up when I tried it earlier. Let's see if it's up now. Yeah, you know, if it's broken and they've stopped maintaining it, I might have to talk about something else. But unfortunately, it's the only paper that um, gives a really nice sort of broad perspective of how uh, to build a system like this, because it was very simple at the time. Um, I've just described a system for summarizing all of the news. So the question is, there may be thousands of articles. What do you actually end up reading if I'm looking at uh, this page, which you know, lists a headline and then all the other stuff in it? So far, it's not really a filter, because I've categorized everything, but I haven't said anything about what's at the top and what's at the bottom of this list. All right, so here's Google's health category. So first of all, it puts aspirin use linked to macular degeneration at the top above all of the other stories. And then within each, each, within each story, the top one here is, um, looks like it's from MedPage. It has a picture from the BBC. And then all of it, it has these other stories. It has, you know, uh, US News and World Report, um, Daily Mail. Times of London, blah, 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 blah. There's all these other things. So what Google News is doing that 
everything we've discussed is not doing is not only figuring out what stories there are and grouping them all together, but it's saying, I'm going to put this one at the top. How do you think it does that? Yeah, time does matter. Um, definitely, as things get older, they fall down. How else? What else? What other factors can it use to decide what to put on top? I heard click through and yeah, how many stories there are. So something that has ten thousand stories, or as we saw, what was it, twenty thousand for this thing? Um, it's going to be at the top. That's why this is the top story. Because it's a big event, right? If everybody's writing a story about it, it's, uh, it's, what it's doing is it's summarizing the collective judgment of editors around the world, saying this is a big story. How else? What's that? Views, yeah. So uh, that's the uh, same as click-throughs. You know, If more people click on this story, then it's going to say, oh, OK, people seem to want that one. There's actually f like five or six other things that it does. Does anyone want to throw out a few other guesses? You and then you. Search terms. Yeah, I don't know if it does that, but I wouldn't. It wouldn't be surprising, you know, if 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 people s s keep searching for Lady Gaga, and there you go. There's Lady Gaga news. Oh, I can add it to my news homepage. Sweet. Um, then maybe it will say, well, if everybody wants to know, then I'm going to move it to the top. What else? Yep, popularity on social media. There's more. There's lots. There's like a number of people who linked to it. Um, and it also does personalization. So recommended. Um, actually, somewhere. I think it used to say recommended for you. But in any case, it really does uh, try to figure out what, yeah, what you would want, what I would want in particular, uh, which we haven't talked about at all, but we're going to talk about next class, is how you build a recommendation system that's personal. Because one of the, um, one of the issues when you deal with this overwhelming amount of information is that traditionally everybody saw the same stories, saw the same headlines. But if you think about it, maybe not everybody needs the same headlines. Now, I mean, I think there's still reasons you kind of want everybody to have this, the, the, a similar view of the world, and we're going to talk about that as well. But if I'm a teacher, I probably need different news than if I work in a bakery, or I'm a taxi driver, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a professor. Right? I, need, I need different news depending on what's going to affect me and what I can do in the world. So uh, part of designing a filtering system is asking, how do I tailor this news for individual people? And also, people are interested in different things probably the simplest way to uh, personalize the news. Uh, there you go. I just said that. OK, we're, um, we're now in a position. This is, this is the mathematical definition of the filter design problem. We're going to look at a different definition later that's uh, more, I guess, broader. But. This, is a, this lecture is on filter design algorithms. So this is the formal definition of a, a filtering algorithm. So the basic idea is you take everything that the computer knows, and you have to compute for each of these articles a ranking. What goes at the top, what goes at the bottom. And then you take the top 10 or the top 20 stories, and you show them. And that's your personalized news. So you have information about the user. You have information about the story, because you have the, you know, you have the document vectors and the category and all of this stuff. You have what I showed the user before. So maybe if I sh 
um, you know, if I showed you a bunch of stories about the volcanic eruption an hour ago, maybe I don't need to show you a bunch of stories about that now. Um, it's a thing that people don't often think about, but actually real filtering functions do use it, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then you have all this other knowledge, which I'm going to call background knowledge. And one of the types of background knowledge is what are all the other users doing? Maybe if everyone is clicking on a story, then you should see it too. Um, and given all of those items of information for each story, return a value which I'll arbitrarily say is between 0 and 1. And then I take every story that I've scraped from the web, I run this function on it, and I return the 10 with the highest value. And that generates this list of stories. Now, broadly speaking, that is exactly what Google News is doing. Uh, there is some function which computes this for every story, which computes some ranking. And then it picks the top ones and shows it to you. And this is sometimes called the relevance. Relevance is a funny word. Uh, it has a lot of different meanings. But uh, it comes from the information retrieval wor world where um, the user is looking for a particular thing, right? So if I type in, uh, how do I make pickles? And there's a document which talks about how to make pickles. It has high relevance. If there's a document which talks about you know, how to, uh, you know, what types of pickles are delicious, maybe it has a lower relevance. If there's a document that talks about a volcano, it has a much lower relevance. So relevance is usually def was originally defined with respect to a particular query. News is kind of a different problem because the user isn't searching for a particular thing. But there's still this word relevance, which is this idea of at any given moment, some stories are going to be more important to show than others. So when you design an algorithm to filter the news, you are making a choice about what people should see. And the next question we're going to look at uh, after the break is, um, well, OK, so what's a good choice? We've talked about a few things. Uh, or, or we've talked about ways of, of deciding you know, if it has a lot of click-throughs or if um, people are talking about it on social media. But it, it, um, you know, news is not necessarily a popularity contest. So what are, what are good ways to, to decide this? Um, yeah, so there we go. What should a filter do? That's what we're going to do next. But uh, let's take um, a little break. And is the Starbucks open? Are people going to run down and get coffee? <laughs> OK. We'll call it 15 minutes. So please be back here at 8.25. All right, so now that we've talked in great detail about some of the techniques involved in building algorithmic filters, um, we still haven't had answered this question of, of uh, what do we want? Uh, which is a different question and is the more journalistic question. So all right, you're going to write a program to read all of the world's news and choose which stories, videos, etc., to show you. It has to have some criterion to pick out of all those millions of stories which ones it thinks are important for you. So how can it do this? Geographic location, sure, yeah. What else? What they've read before. What they've read before. So how would you use that information? Like if it keeps like even different news, then it will probably be very much Right, so you, you sort of assume that they want to keep reading what they've read before? Yeah, that's the assumption. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a good idea, and all systems do it. It has some problems, but we'll get there. Uh, what else? Sure, yeah, language. How would, uh, I mean, but you know, say I know that you're reading business news about Hong Kong. There's still probably a, you know, a thousand stories published a day. How do, I, how do I decide which one goes at the top? Source. How do I use the source? How? 
So how would I decide which sources are have higher reputation? Okay, so, so the, the, the standard might, might uh, disagree. Um, no, I think there's something to the idea of the reputation of a source. I guess I'm just pushing back because it's very hard to define, and it might also depend on taste. But yes, the source matters. Uh, what else? Um, time. Time. Yeah, so generally for news, newer things are more relevant, although not always, right? If, they're, if you know, last month someone published an amazing article on bees, and maybe you still want to see it. Uh, it doesn't always have to be real time, you know? There's different time scales. Frequency of keywords. Um, okay, uh, can you, what, what do you mean? Okay, but th this is not uh, this is not a search system. This is a news system, right? So if I go to Google News and I just go to the home page, there's no search. It, it doesn't know what I'm searching for because I haven't searched for anything. Um, but you could look at what you've searched for in the past. That's maybe a signal. Information we have about the person. So, what what kind of information do we have? So, demographics. Yeah, demographics. Although, yeah, actually, what we're going to look at next time is uh, rather than demographics, we're going to look at is we're going to define distance metrics on users. We're going to cluster the users instead of clustering the stories. And we're going to say, if I'm in that same cluster as all these other users, then maybe I want the same stories. Um, so what happens if, uh, if I always click on Lady Gaga? Maybe the filter learns that I like Lady Gaga, and all I ever see is Lady Gaga. Is this a good filtering algorithm? Well, what if I click a thousand times on celebrity news? Does that mean I should never see international news? No, it shouldn't, but it would indicate your inclination. Yeah, so you certainly know that, that you have that inclination. Um, so I wanna, I wanna step forward a little bit and talk about, um, this is a headline from um, Manila in World War II. Uh, and I wanna draw your attention to a couple things. First of all, the enormous headline. Uh, and then the smaller headlines. 15 generals among war prisoners, Japanese flag planted in Cebu City. How come the town completely occupied by Japanese is huge and at the top of the place, page, and 15 generals among war prisoners is smaller and on the side? Like how? Why did the editor make that choice? It's a province. Yeah, so su human editors ask questions like, how many people will it affect? And um, this idea of novelty, you know, it's something you haven't seen before. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, we've talked about algorithmic filtering systems, and we don't normally think about it this way, but um, editors are sort of filters, 
right? They, they, they're all of these stories that could be covered, and they assign journalists to cover certain ones, or they select certain stories from the wires, and then they also decide where in, you know, originally the newspaper, but now the, the news site, or the news app, or the news page, whatever, the, the digital display of the news. They, they make these choices about what's high and what's low and, and all of this sort of thing, right? And this is, there's this whole art to it. And they have these criteria like it's going to affect people or you need to know about this. Right, right? You ever hear an editor say this, right? The news you want versus the news you need. So if you make an algorithm that learns that you click on Lady Gaga all the time, uh, then maybe you never learn about important things because the algorithm doesn't know what's important. Has anyone ever heard of this idea before or talked about this? There are some names for this, these types of ideas. Um, here's one of them. So, so this is the idea that rather than having an editor choose stories for us that they think are important, I get to go and read whatever I want. Right? Now, don't get me wrong. I actually think this is wonderful. I think this is one of the best things about the internet. And I'm, I'm not really a fan of having other people choose what I read. You know? And I think a lot of people were sort of upset in the you know, pre-internet era that there were a few people who were very powerful and could set the discourse for everyone else. But you know, what happens uh, is that in practice, we don't necessarily go and seek viewpoints beyond the things that we're already interested in. And um, I like this. This is cute. A tut-tut has been dependent, right? The internet was supposed to be this, you know, broaden our horizons. But of course, it, it, I mean, it does in certain ways, but it doesn't in other ways because we, now we can ignore anything we don't want to hear about, right? Uh, you know, and there's lots of things we don't want to hear about. We don't want to hear about people who disagree with us politically. We don't want to hear about bad things that are going on. We don't want to hear about torture in other parts of the world. We don't want to hear about all of the poor people who live near us. We don't want to hear about human rights violations. We don't want to hear about uh, you know, pr uh, medical problems of, in hospitals. Like, there, there's lots of stuff. Uh, you know, there's that old, old saying, journalism is supposed to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Right? There's lots of things that we would rather not know. And it's very easy to avoid it now. I think easier than it used to be. The argument is that at least if you flipped through a printed publication, you, know, you have to scan past the part where it says, you know, shoddy safety regulations kill three people. Uh, at least you see it for a second. If you have a personalized news filter, you never see it. It just disappears from your universe. Or this is the argument. There are counter-arguments. But there's some evidence that this actually happens. This is, um, all right, so if you go to Amazon and you click on a, a, a book, it's, it says at the bottom, people who bought this book also bought that book. Right? You've seen that? Everyone's seen that, the recommendations? So you can trace that. You can, it's, it's a graph, right? So if you start with your government failed you, it says, truth and consequences is also bought. And then the end of America, and then the true story of the Bilderberg Group. And you know, anyway. Um, and somebody did this during the 2008 election with political books. And uh, basically, people bought books on one side of the political spectrum and the other, but not both. You don't see really er many arrows between these two, although you see a couple that are kind of in the middle. By and large, people are reading one side or the other. And you see this on Twitter, too. Um, so what they did here is they filtered all of these tweets that had political content, so s starting from a very large set of keywords. And they labeled some keywords as red versus blue, that is liberal versus conservative in the US. And then they looked at the graph of all of the retweets. So if there's an edge between these two, right? so this to here means all of these people retweeted that person's tweet. And there's a little bit of crossover, but not very much. Basically, people only retweet uh, one type or the other. 
I don't think Facebook is filtering it based on what they think you want to hear. But what does happen is uh, homophily. Um, so your friends are already similar to you, right? So if you filter based on what your friends are reading, you're going to hear the things that you're already hearing because you're already talking to your friends. Mm -hmm. um, I have very conservative friends, mm -hmm. so the stuff that comes up on the news feeds are all my business management, everything they're reading about. Right. So what's happening is all the conservative friends who, in real life, would have equally a loud voice, but on the internet or on my news feed. Well, Facebook does keep track of how often you like, click through, comment, share. So it, if, you, if it's discovering that you're not sharing things from certain people, it will stop showing them to you. So that, um, we'll get back to that. That's actually a, a very, the basis of an argument. Um, this is a map of the Persian language blogosphere, or at least as it was in 2009. Um, each dot is a blog. Larger dots have more uh, inbound links. Dots are placed very, very like multidimensional scaling, right? Uh, dots are placed close together if they have a lot of connections between them. Uh, and then they are sorted by the colors are human assigned. Uh, so, for example, Persian poetry gets that uh, purpley color. Uh, that means when someone read it and, and assigned it that color. And what you find, first of all, is that you get clusters of a solid color, which means that blogs that are about similar things tend to link to each other. And you also find that uh, they don't link to each other very much. So, you know, as you would expect, reformist politics and conservative politics aren't, you know, uh, that close. But religious use and youth and conservative politics are much closer. And so this effect is real. People really do segregate their information sources, who they link to, what they retweet, the books they read. There really is, are these breakdowns uh, or, or differentiations. So it's not just a theoretical thing. And of course, this has always been true, right? Your, your friends, the people who li li near live you, near live you, wow, must be getting late, who live near you have always been more similar to you. In fact, um, let, me, let me show you something. Uh, road. There you go. This is uh, census tract level, so um, like almost the block level uh, data for how people voted in Michigan. And what you see is, this, is some very interesting patterns. First of all, basically, the higher the population density, the more liberal you're voting. Also, it points out that along the old railroad corridors, like this corridor here, um, and up through here tend to be more liberal as well. But the point I'm making is that, um, you know, it's all, it's all very well to talk about how you're very independent-minded and you make your own choices, but you really don't. Uh, basically, you're surrounded by people who think the same way as you, uh, both physically, as in geographically, and in terms of who you associate with. And this is normal. This is human. This happens all the time but we've brought this pattern to the internet. The question is, do we want to bring it to our filters? So there's this idea. Uh, the, the, it's, it's, old, it's an older idea, but the, the phrase, the filter bubble, comes from a guy called Eli Pariser, who's been involved in politics in the US. And what he's pointing out is that it's true that we have choices about the sort of things that we're interested in, and we go and get information on the things that we're interested in. That's great. But what we're interested in and what we think is important also depends on the information that we get. So if you start clicking on Lady Gaga, and then because you're clicking on it, 
the filter shows you more Lady Gaga, then you're going to see, you're going to start believing that Lady Gaga is, is more newsworthy because it's, she's always going to be in the news, according to you. Right? So there's this feedback. Now, he's mostly concerned about um, political affiliation, but there's a lot of different axes of diversity, right? How much international news do I get? Uh, news about people from different um, socioeconomic strata, right? Uh, uh, racial boundaries, news in other languages, uh, news from other countries, uh, news about science, if I never read news about science, right? There's uh, news about art. Uh, you know, there, there's something to be argued that you know, maybe you should have a, a broad view of what the news is. And if you design the filters wrong, it, uh, if you design them so that they chase your interests and never try to broaden them, then it's just going to get narrower and narrower. Oh, well, that's the idea. Um, And this is not only in terms of, this can happen in different ways. If you build an algorithm that tries to maximize click-throughs or likes or shares, that's one way it can happen. Uh, if you build an algorithm that shows you things that your friends liked, your friends are already similar to you. you yeah, I mean, it's nice to see that your things your friends like. I'm not recommending that you not see the things that your friends like. But it's also really important to get things that uh, none of your friends like. So you saw earlier a mathematical definition of the filter design problem. This is a, a broader view. There are different types of questions. Some of these answers are technical, as we saw, uh, based on how, what information you have and what it's possible to do algorithmically. But some of them are normative. Who's run into this word normative? What do I mean by that? Someone must have heard this word before. Well, this one, really. Um, so a norm, does, does anyone know what a norm is? Exactly, it's what should be, right? So the normative questions are questions about what we, would, what we want, what we think is right or what we think is good, right? So. There are, there are normative issues in, in um, filter design, right? So one of them is, you know, it should, it should be good for me. But there's this other issue, which is that it should be good for the functioning of the society as a whole. If we're going to say that the only information we ever get comes through these algorithms, which is more and more true, because most of you, uh, most of the information you get is mediated by social networks, by personalization systems, by RSS feeds, all of these algorithms, then, you know, it used to be that everybody was really upset about media ownership, right? In, in uh, where there's market media, you don't want too many people to own, you know, all of the radio stations and all of the television stations and all of the newspapers. Uh, or they're upset about state control of media, which is, you know, obviously an issue in China. You don't want all of the media to, re to be run and controlled by the government. There's this idea that maybe you know, a single person or a single organization shouldn't have the ability to decide what everyone else sees. Well, this is kind of a similar thing, right? Maybe one algorithm shouldn't decide what everybody sees. And maybe if we're going to talk about algorithms for showing us th the news, we should think about what effects it has on the society on a whole, not just on us individually. And so this, I believe, is an aspect of filter design. You can imagine different ways to do this. I imagine um, a, uh, there are different ways. I imagine a randomness slider, right? So depending on how adventurous I'm feeling on any given day, you know, turn up the slider, show me something farther and farther away from what I normally read. And you can imagine algorithmic implementations of this, right? If I have, if, if I store a vector of the stories that I've clicked on, right? Just like I have this vector, which is all the business stories, if I store a vector of the stories that I tend to read, then 
you can look for stories that are farther and farther away from that and find things that are more and more different. So there are mathematical expressions of these ideas. I also imagine maps. So another way to solve this problem is if these are all of the blogs, this is really a small section of it because it's just one language, um, you could put a little UR here marker, right? So I could put a little, you've read this blog and this blog and you're subscribed to this blog and this blog and that one. And then I could see that picture. If I had that in Google Reader, maybe one day I could look at that picture and go, you know, I've never read anything over here and click on it and see what it is. So you could, you could build filters that are more diverse. You could um, give people maps of what is available. You know, if I have a, a map of the world, maybe I've never left my country, but at least I know the other countries are there. In terms of information sources, most of the time we don't even know what's out there. But we could, because we can do visualizations like this. The point would be to build these into the news reading systems, which nobody seems to have done yet. So different aspects. There are these normative aspects. Then there's a UI aspect. How do I tell the computer what I want? You know, it can watch me click on things, but uh, I sort of want to go, Siri, I want more articles on artificial intelligence in my news feed. You know, it's, it's, it's this type of thing. Um, maybe that's a good UI. Maybe we could actually do that. Maybe uh, we could build a UI based on these maps again, where you like grab a section of these and say, show me more of this. Uh, there's all kinds of possible UIs for telling the computer what, what you're looking for. And the challenge is to go from sort of there's this intersection of, of what it's technically possible to do, because ultimately you have to turn it into feature vectors and points in space and topic models and all of this stuff, right? But you have to find some way to humanize that in a way that people can understand, in a way that uh, makes it easy to tell your computer what you want. And then, of course, you can't just imagine a filter. I want a computer that understands exactly what I need to know, but sometimes surprises me and never misses a story that I would have wanted to know, right? It has to be possible to do it, both from an algorithmic point of view and an economic point of view, right? So another way you could do this is, yeah, what you want is a personal secretary, all right? That would be a great filter. In fact, you want a 100 of them because they're going to read every news source every day and summarize it for you. And if you're the president, that's what you have. But if I'm, uh, if I'm a news filtering service or a news aggregation startup, and I'm getting $2 a month from each user, I can't pay 100 people for each user. And also, some algorithms are more expensive to run. They require more memory, disk space, compute power. So the economics play a role. There's the question of how expensive is it to provide the filtering service. And so the, the filtering is not just an algorithm. It's the question of what can we build that meets all of these criteria. And so it's actually a very hard problem. I want to show you one last thing. It's another idea that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I can build a filtering system that tries to show you other points of view. I can't make you use it. If, if I tell, you know, and further, if I have a filtering system, and, you know, I don't care about football. Don't ever show it to me. Right? That should be possible. I don't. Ultimately, it has to follow what the user wants. Um, and so people are going to have to make their own choices. And so there's a name for this idea. It's called the information diet. There's now a, a book with this. And the idea is, this is actually an idea for putting labels on, new, on news sources, right? Um, how much of, you know, what kind of news have you read? Uh, and one idea is literally labeling a news source. You know, CNN is composed of 
72% car crashes, you know. <laughs> but, but actually, uh, television news is. Like, um, you know, local television news is mostly crime. Um, which is not necessarily bad. I mean, who am I to say that that's wrong? But uh, to be able to compare it with different sources in a sensible way is kind of an interesting idea. And he has this other idea, which is, show me what I'm reading. Um, so watch, this is kind of similar to the mapping idea that I was talking about. Watch what I'm doing over the last week and then build this label for me. You know, my god, you're consuming 22% Paris Hilton. Um, th there's a lot of different ways to go about this. What I'm trying to say is it's not just about designing the filtering algorithm. It's, it's about designing the tools that let us understand what we're doing so we can make choices about it, uh, which is um, we're actually not going to talk about that idea again in this course, but I want to point out that uh, the techniques that we're using in terms of classifying documents uh, would work to build that system. Uh, I could take every story that you've read in the past week, run a clustering algorithm on it, run a summarization algorithm on it, and tell you what you've been reading. Same technologies. All right, that's uh, the end of the slide deck. Thoughts, questions? Has anyone done this? Nobody has done this. So you could make one. There are two people sitting next to you who could probably make one. No, you two. You're the programmers. Yeah, but if you tried to build this, then by the end of building it, you'd be a good programmer. If it's the first one, you can't get it wrong. There you go. <laughs> right. The, the prototype is going to be better than anything that's ever existed before because it's never existed before. OK. But most of what journalism does loses money. That shouldn't stop us. <laughs> It could be creepy. When you see the recommended thing, you write a couple times, you write times, it's like, <laughs> if you're a journalist, all of that goes out the window. Researching whatever story, you're looking into. So at some point, they would have started giving you stuff about sex trafficking. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're, we're really at the beginning of this. Our interfaces are very primitive. Um, Anyway, we're going to talk a lot more about filtering in the next lecture on Friday. We're, we've talked about algorithmic filters, where the computer is looking at the content. We're going to talk about social filters, where uh, it looks at the feedback from a lot of different users, um, not just social networks, but things like um, uh, the Facebook news feed, which is partially algorithmic, but driven by social si signals. We're going to look at recommendation systems. So, you know, that part of Amazon which says if you bought X, you also want Y, or the Netflix movie recommendations, or uh, the iTunes Genius, or Pandora, the recommendation systems in general. We're going to look at how they work. Uh, th we are also going to start that class by, with the homework that you're going to turn in, which is the, uh, some of you are coding up the TFIDF stuff, and some of you are doing the uh, summarization. Um, I've already got a couple of them. They're really interesting, actually. Um, uh, so please uh, give me the summaries, you know, an hour before class so that I have time to put them on slides, something like that. Um, and uh, there is no homework at the end of this class because I know you're already working on the other one. And uh, that's it. It's uh, Tuesday night is 9. Uh, go have a beer. <laughs>